Well, we're in the second part of this series that we have entitled The Blood. And we've been looking at this, this, this biblical concept called the blood because many of us have not fully understood how important blood is to the Old Testament and the New Testament and how that blood actually represents the scarlet thread that holds the Old and New Testament together. And because we don't understand the power of Jesus' blood for us, we don't live with a sense of confidence in our relationship with him. And so what ends up happening is we're always renegotiating our relationship with God. Are you going to answer my prayer? Are you going to be there with me? When we go through difficult moments, uh, can I count on you? We're always questioning and we don't have the confidence that we're supposed to have in our relationship with God. And God does not want us to live that way. And you're going to see throughout this message the investment that God has made in our lives so that we could be in his family. How dare we question if he's going to be there for us? That's what I want to show you when we go through this message, that you can have a confidence that when life happens to you, you can count on and depend on him. And that you will live with a sense of confidence that even though I may not feel that God is with me, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's not only with me, but he's for me. Amen. And so last week we talked about how life is in the blood and that blood is the only thing that God has given on earth that, that perpetuates life. You can take all of our organs out and you can replace them with machines and medical science has done that, but medical science cannot replicate blood. That's why we have to donate blood because that's the only place you can get blood is from a human body that God has created. And so life is in blood. And so when we look at the Bible, we have to understand that, that, that when God speaks of blood, he's talking about something that's life-giving. And so today I want to talk about types and shadows. And I want to talk about this subject of types and shadows because many of us think that the New Testament and the Old Testament are kind of two separate books. And so we like the, old, we like the New Testament because we like Jesus and we like all the things that Jesus talks about. But when it comes to that Old Testament, it just seems a little disconnected. It seems a little violent. It seems really, it seems very bloody. But what I want to show you today is that the Old Testament is nothing more than a type and a shadow for what the New Testament is actually shows us. So let's start with our first statement of the day. If you take out your note sheet, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll follow along with us. So the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So when I'm reading the Old Testament, there is actually truth there that I don't fully understand until I get to the New Testament. So as I'm reading the Old Testament about the sacrificial rituals and, and the stories of people like Jonah, it is all a process of helping me understand that there's something greater that's being concealed. And so the New Testament then is the Old Testament revealed. So when I read the New Testament, it is actually fulfilling what the Old Testament actually spoke. And that's so important because these two books are not disconnected. There isn't a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. It's the same God, and the way he operates is actually the same. And so from Genesis, we see when sin entered the world, that blood had to be shed at that moment to cover the sins of humanity. And so throughout the Old Testament, we, we get a sense that God is up to something, but we don't get the full sense of what he's up to until we get to the New Testament. Are you all with that? So we can't, as believers, get caught up in living by the Old Testament rules and regulations. And we always have to be careful as we, as we relate to God, because for some reason, humans, we, we, we actually thrive on rules. Yeah. And where there isn't a rule, we'll try to make up one. We do. You can take something that's just so simple and easy, and before too long, we will add rules and regulations and guidelines and policies and procedures because we like these things to confine us and contain us. But you can't have an authentic relationship with God if you're doing it based on rules and regulations. 
You can't say, oh, I forgot to read the Bible today, so God must be mad at me. Oh, I read a lot of the Bible today, so I know God loves me. Listen, if God's love for you is determined based on how much of the Bible you read or don't read, you don't have a real relationship. Are you all hearing me? But yet we feel badly because we feel internally there's a rule. I got to read Bible, and I, I can't just read one verse because that's not enough, but I can't read a couple of chapters because that's kind of too much, so I'll just read like a chapter and a half, and that feels about what God, would be, uh, what God would be pleased with. Listen, God is pleased with you even if you don't read the Bible. And see how you got quiet right there? Because you're used to, used to the rules. God loves you. He can't stop loving you because you don't read the Bible. Your reading the Bible actually gets you so you can know him more. But it's not going to make him love you anymore or love you any less. I need you to hear me. And so when Paul was talking about how we look at the Old Testament, he says, don't get caught up in the rules. Don't say, oh, well, I didn't commit adultery. I didn't lie. I didn't steal. I, I, I didn't bear false witness. I didn't do all those things. So I'm pretty good with you, right, God? I'm okay. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Because the Old Testament, let's look at Colossians. He says the Old Testament, all those rules and regulations, they're nothing more than a shadow of things to come. But the substance... See, the substance is of Christ. So what I read in the Old Testament, all those rules and regulations and the, and the, the, the ceremonies and everything else, they were nothing more than a, a signpost pointing that something greater is coming. And the substance of all of those rituals is actually Christ. But notice it's a shadow. Now we understand what a shadow is. A shadow, when light is cast on something, it casts a shadow. The shadow is not the real thing. It is simply a representation of the real thing. And so if you're living your life by rules and regulations and you're patting yourself on the back that you're so good because you've done all this religious stuff, you're living by a shadow. And you've missed the substance. Because the substance is a real relationship with God. I don't read the Bible because I have to. I don't pray because I have to. No, no, no. I read the Bible because I want to. I get to. I desire to. I pray because I desire to, because I'm checking off a list to, so I can be acceptable to God. Are you all hearing me today? So let's look at these definitions really quickly. A type is a divinely purposed illustration using a person, event, place, institution, or ceremony which points to a greater truth. So a type is like a symbol, and what it's doing is it's pointing to something that's greater. A shadow, on the other hand, is a likeness, a reflection, a symbol, or silhouette of an original. So the Old Testament is full of types and shadows. They're not the real thing, but they're pointing to something that is real. Remember the story of Jonah? And uh, Jonah, remember, he was told to go to Nineveh and preach the word of God and preach repentance to the people in Nineveh, and he didn't want to go. So he got on a ship and went in the opposite direction. But then on the way there, the storm arose, they throw Jonah over, he spends three days in the belly of a fish, and then on the third day, he's spewed out on land, and he's, he's put out right there at Nineveh where he's supposed to be, and he preaches the gospel, preaches the, the good news, which is God has forgiven you, to all these people in Nineveh, they repent and they get right with God. Well, that story is actually a type of Jesus Christ. It's a shadow of Jesus Christ because Jesus went into the belly of the earth for three days and when he came up, he came out of the grave and he preached repentance to all of us. You see, so it's a type. So you don't get the full importance. Why did Jonah have to go in the belly of a fish? It just doesn't make sense. Why couldn't the storm just drive him right to Nineveh? Well, because God was setting up a type and a shadow to point to something greater. You all getting it? So let's see what Paul says about Adam, because Adam is a type. So still everyone died. So because of Adam and Eve's sin, how many people die? Everyone. So everybody dies, okay? Now that was not the original intent. You and I were originally designed to live forever with God. But because of Adam and Eve's sin, we now have an expiration date. 
Every human has an expiration date. So still everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. So basically because of Adam, everybody has to die. Let's go to the next verse. Now Adam is a a symbol. So Adam is not just a human, but he is a symbol of something else. He's pointing to something else. And look, look what he's pointing to. He is a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So because of Adam, everybody dies. Right? That's what the scripture just said. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians. Because 1 Corinthians says, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. So everybody dies because of Adam, but everybody lives because of Jesus. And so just like everybody dies, like we we all agree we're all going to die one day, right? Well, we need to believe that everybody can live through Jesus Christ and have that same level of confidence in that. And so in the Old Testament, what God did was he gave them a system a system of animal sacrifice. And next week I'm going to talk about the tabernacle and I'm going to walk you through how the priest uh, performed the, the sacrifices because once again, when you understand these types and shadows, you'll understand how the Old Testament was setting us up for what God was going to do in the New Testament through Jesus and why you can have a confidence in your relationship with God because God did not send his son Jesus to die on the cross just so that you could spend the rest of your life wondering, am I going to make it into heaven? Now you need to have a confidence that because Jesus died for me, I know I'm going to heaven, but also I know I'm going to live victoriously here on earth. Amen. That was a good place to say amen and you all left me hanging. No, honestly, because see, listen, there's a mindset that says, listen, teach people about suffering. Teach them how hard life can be. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't need to hear a message about suffering. I don't need to hear a message about pain. I don't need to be convinced that there's pain in life. I don't need someone to convince me that things are not always going to go my way. I know about that. What I need to know is when things don't go my way, how can I get out of them? When my world is turned upside down, how can it be turned right side up? I need to know that when I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, that I can make it back up to the mountaintop. That's what I need to know. And So Paul said that just as everybody dies because of Adam, everybody who belongs to Christ will be given new life. And so that old system points to a better system. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. We're talking about this animal sacrifice again, remember? The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow. See that word again? It was just a shadow. It was a a foretaste of what was to come. A dim preview of the good things to come. See, you understand what God has in store for you? He has good things in store for you. You've got to believe that. He has good things. I know your marriage may have failed, but he still has good things in store for you. I know that it may, you, you know, the doctor may have given you a bad diagnosis, but God still has some good things that are in store for you. I know your business is right on the edge of profitability, and you're not sure if it'll be able to keep it going, but God says he has some good things to come for you. Yes, sir. Amen, amen, amen. And the good, and so look at it, it says, so the sacrifices under that system are repeated Again and again, year after year, animal sacrifices, they had to keep on happening. Innocent animals had to die because of our sin. And every day, every day, and you're going to see this next week, every day, animals were killed because of humanity's sin. Again and again, year after year, but they never were able to provide perfect cleansing. See, his... These animal sacrifices, they couldn't provide that perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. That's what's at stake. What's at stake when we don't understand that our sins have been forgiven and our sins have been cleansed? What's at stake is our worship of God. 
Because you can't draw close to God if there's always this wall of guilt and shame. If you're always not good enough. No, no, no. You got to understand in God's eyes, you're good enough. Through the blood of Jesus, we all look wonderful. But those animal sacrifices couldn't do it. Let's keep going. Because if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified. Come on, say it with me. Once for all time. See, if the animal sacrifices had worked, it would have only needed to be done one time. But because they didn't work, they had to keep on being done. Day after day after day after day, multiple times a day. That's why it's so important when we read in the New Testament how Jesus shed his blood once for all time. See, that, that has power now because we understand that for hundreds of years, animals have been slaughtered in order to deal with, to cover our sin. But when Jesus shed his blood, he only had to do it one time. And that one time was good enough to handle all of our sin. Once for all time. That's why you can have a confidence. That's why you shouldn't live your life feeling guilty. Oh, I remember what I did when I was in college. Oh, I remember what I did last week. Oh, I don't know if I could even come to the altar and pray today because I got in a bad argument with my wife. Listen, you don't have a relationship with God based on what you do. You have access to God because you believe. And once you believe, he'll change your actions. His forgiveness is available to you because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going on. And their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. See, if you're living with guilt, you're still dealing with the old system. Because that old system couldn't deal with guilt. But instead, those those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. Every time they they messed up, intentionally or unintentionally, they had to bring an animal for sacrifice. A turtle dove, a ram, a goat, a lamb. Every time you messed up, even if you, 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 you know, they had burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, and all these different offerings, you were always dealing with your sin. Oh, I messed up. I told my wife she looked, she looked pretty in that dress. She didn't look pretty. Oh my God, I got to take a turtle dove to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the altar and let the priest uh, sacrifice it because I told a lie. Every day, that's how it worked. Every time you did something, intentionally or unintentionally, you had to bring an animal. It wasn't sufficient. And every time you had to bring an animal and you saw a precious animal die for your sins, that just reinforced the guilt. But it never had the power to change them. That's why the sacrifices had to keep on going year after year. And so Hebrews 10 lets us know this. Look at it. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. See, the blood of bulls and goats covered it, but it couldn't take it away. So let me give you three points here that I want you to see. The first is the true punishment for sin. Something always dies when sin is present. Hear me today. Don't you ever get comfortable with habitual sin in your life? Because something is dying every time you sin. Don't you buy into the lie of the culture, well, everybody has something. No. Jesus died, so I don't have to have that something. Now understand me, you and I will never be sinless. But we should sin less every day. Every day we ought to be better. Every day we ought to be getting better. But if I still keep habitually doing the same thing, then I've not really accepted the true blood of Jesus Christ. If you've gotten comfortable with your sin and you've now begun to identify with your sin, you've missed out on what the blood of Jesus can really do. But understand me. The true punishment for sin is death. Something dies. Relationships die. People die. Promises die. Futures die. Goals and dreams die. Something always dies when sin is present. 
That's why God said to them in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he said that if you eat its fruit, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's living by all those rules and regulations and what you know. Well, if you eat of its fruit, you, will, you are sure to die. If you and I try to eat the, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, it'll mess us up every time. So understand that sin produces death. We know in the New Testament, Paul said in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. So you're, if, you're, if you are habitually in sin, you are working for a payday that you will not like. Because that payday is death. Second point I want you to understand is that uh, the blood that was shed, these animal sacrifices, were a temporary payment for sin. All they did was cover the sin for that day. That's it. In fact, the priest actually made a morning and an evening sacrifice. So what that meant was with the morning sacrifice was meant to cover any sins that were committed overnight. And then there was an evening sacrifice to take care of any sins that were committed during the day. But guess what had to happen the very next day? Another sacrifice had to be made. So it was an ongoing process. It was a temporary payment for sin. Because sin always has a payment. We, talk, we talked about that last week. Sin always demands a payment. Sin creates a debt. Think of it like a credit card. You can charge up all day long, but that bill is coming. And if you've not prepared properly, you won't be able to pay that bill. And that's what we did with sin in our lives. We let our sin debt become so great that we could not handle it. And so this, these were temporary payments for the sins that we committed. That's why uh, in that Hebrew scripture we read at the beginning, it said that we will, let's flip to the next scripture, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Those animal sacrifices, they, they weren't perfect cleansing. They were temporary, but they couldn't last forever. And then point number three, which is where I wanted, wanted to get us to for today, these animal sacrifices are a type for Jesus' sacrifice. That when you read through the Leviticus and you see all these animals being slaughtered and how they had, the, had precision and how they were slaughtered and how the blood had to be treated in the tabernacle, you, you get a glimpse of what God was setting us up for with the sacrifice of Jesus. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Let's see what he says here. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. Let's keep going. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. God has established a better system, and that better system is Jesus. No, you need to understand that. You see, so when you look at from Genesis to Revelation, and you see how God has been operating with us as his children, then you understand there is a sense of intentionality. Why would I spend this message teaching about, you know, types and shadows? That's even a boring title. Well, the reason why is because I want you to have a confidence that God was so intentional in wanting to have a relationship with you that from the moment Adam and Eve messed up, he put in place a plan to get us back to him. And even though time went on, God was always working on how to get us a seat at his table. So how dare you think that you don't matter to God? How dare you think that God has forgotten about you? Don't you understand that from the moment you were born, there was a place setting put at his table with your name on it? And the blood of Jesus, that better system, is what gives you access to that seat. So why live like a pauper? Why live like an orphan? Why live like someone who's unloved when you have a heavenly father that would send his only begotten son to die for you? There's power. Power. Wonder-working power. In the blood of the lamb. There's power. Power. 
wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength. I'm not living in my own strength. But I live because of the strength that I get from the blood of Jesus Christ. The strength that cleanses me. The blood that, that frees me. The blood that picks me up. That blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.